So uh, the next session uh, is by Ian Dennison from Cadence, and it's uh, it's called Moving to the Mainstream: Design Enablement for Photonic Systems. And Ian's experience actually spans 34 years within the electric design automation industry. Uh, and he's got expertise in electrical product design, enablement for analog, digital, and system design with R&D teams all around the world. And so I'm going to stop there, Ian, and let you take it. That's okay? Good. Thanks again. Good, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, we had a little technical difficulty earlier, so um, I can't see anything on my screen. I can only see this one, so let's read it together. <laughs> um, okay, and I've also got to keep running back. but. Um, yeah, Cadence, uh, Cadence is a leading provider of electronic design automation uh, tools and silicon IP. So we have around about 30 years experience in the acceleration of the design, verification and physical implementation of our customers' electronics. Um, we have a particular strength in custom IC design and uh, as you'll see in the presentation, along with our partners, we're now working to uh, focus that strength on silicon photonics design as well. Uh, here's Yol's uh, predictions for the market, and we're around about here, 2017, and we have maybe a 200 million, actually a little less, 200 million market today. And if we wind forward to 2025, we're looking at 1.6 billion. So that's an 8x increase in eight years. So it's a great opportunity, a great, op uh, a great time to be in this uh, space. The other thing to notice is that the, the vast bulk of this is the green, that's for the typical top of the rack data center kind of applications. But what you can see is a rising orange uh, component, which is for, well, for other applications, but a lot of that will be for sensors. And uh, I think this is where we're going to see more opportunity for silicon photonics. Oh, if you want, yeah. Okay, so here we go with our technical problems. Um, you'll just have to live with it. It's the best we could do. But um, LiDAR is clearly a, a, an excellent application for photonics. It's a light-based problem. Photonics is a light-based solution. Within the autonomous vehicle activities that many of our customers are currently involved in, uh, there is a clear need and interest for LiDAR. Uh, there are complementary technologies in radar and camera, but the practice is that for an autonomous vehicle, you're going to need all three classes of sensor to have the appropriate coverage. Each of these different classes of sensor has different pros and cons. Uh, the thing that LiDAR is particularly good is for excellent lateral and range resolution, sorry, depth resolution. And if we can use LiDAR in combination with radar and camera, we will have an effective sensing uh, capability for the autonomous vehicle. The thing that LiDAR falls down on badly is it's got a very low score on sensor size and on sensor cost. Uh, nothing to do with photonics, more to do with the technologies around at the moment, but we'll come to that. Uh, next, please. So as many of you will know, when you're trying to develop a LiDAR solution, um, you're sending out a series of light beams of constantly changing frequency, and you're receiving back a light beam which has a signature frequency on it. That signature can be used to determine how long it actually took for that light to get to the target and back again. So the technique is simply to put a tunable laser, which is constantly rising up through the frequencies and then back down and back up again, put that uh, tunable laser through some waveguide uh, splitters and couplers. And in essence, what we do, we get to this point here, we're blending together the uh, light that we sent to the target with the light that's currently being generated by the tunable <laughs> laser. And that, in essence, is a combination of transmit and receive signals which produces a beep frequency. That beep frequency, low, very low frequency compared with the kind of frequencies that we're dealing with with light, basically the uh, electronics now have something much more uh, manageable. They're no longer having to sample at the kind of rates that might be necessary to deal with a light-based solution to a light-based problem. So this is an excellent uh, mechanism for uh, downstepping the, the speed and the, the utility of the uh, photonics into electronics. Now, 
that is around about, for an automotive application, 10 centimeters kind of depth resolution. That's fine. As long as you're not going to hit the vehicle in front within 10 centimeters, you're fine. But if you want to get down to something like microsurgery or robotic uh, industrial applications, where you might need down to something as, as fine as 10 micrometers, then you're looking at improving your resolution by 10,000 X. And so what do you do? It's possible then to uh, change the performance of your tunable laser and really take a strong grip on it with what amounts to a, a, an electro-optical phase lock loop. And through this mechanism, we're able to monitor, uh, again using the diodes and again using sort of beat mechanism, we're able to monitor the slope in a way which we can maintain very, very tight control of the slope, very, very tight accuracy. And therefore, the, the laser is being tuned by a, an assessment of its own performance. And we go through that loop. And so this is great. We're beginning to see applications now which are not just top of rack communications across data centers, but some actual optical processing in effect. We're actually doing some work that might otherwise be done by electronics. We're doing it with photoelectronics. And this could be the start of some great things. So LiDAR, the race is on for a solid state system. I mean, if you've seen any of the test vehicles for autonomous vehicles out there on the streets with kind of rotating LiDARs on the top, mechanical units, they cost about $80,000, far, far too expensive. In essence, the race is on to find a solid state solution, which may be $200, $100, something like that. And that way, you'll be able to place the sensors on the four corners of the vehicle. You'll be able to seamlessly integrate it into the body shape. None of the problems that you see with these test vehicles out on the road. And so you also have applications beyond automotive, but looking at a solution which might be constructed in a solid state manner, we're looking at some 3.5 material laser. We're looking at some silicon photonics. We're looking at MEMS. We're looking at an SOC control. That control is controlling the MEMS chip. It's controlling the photonics chip and reading the photonics chip. Uh, and it's controlling that um, tunable laser. So uh, Cadence has unique design enablement in this space. We'll briefly look at our analog and mixed signal SOC design enablement, our MEMS design enablement, our silicon photonics enablement, and our system in a package enablement. Just, um, just before we go to the next slide, of course, the point is that this, these beams of light that are being sent out in front you're having to scan about oh, 50,000 data points a second. So you're taking in the scene ahead. Well, I don't know how many that second is. It's not quite 50,000. <laughs> All right, so let's start with the system in a package. Um, some of the previous speakers talked about some of these problems and issues. Cadence okay, has design enablement technology, whether you're doing interposer-based design with uh, flip chips, uh, sorry, side-by-sides <coughs> with uh, wire bonding, uh, whether you're using stacking with wire bonding, whether you're using 3D stacks and uh, silicon, through silicon vias, uh, whether you're using wafer-scale chip-level packaging where you've got some very, very fine um, form factors, but also this brings about some uh, warpage <coughs> problems which also need to be managed carefully to get uh, the performance metrics in all of the tick boxes that you require. Now, all of this uh, kind of packaging technology brings together electronics and other th systems into a very tight space, and you need to worry then about some of the physical effects of your packaging on your design. So there may be thermal effects, um, there may be electromagnetic effects. Uh, our security technologies are there to enable you to evaluate those effects. Here we've done a, an extraction of all of the uh, vias and other elements of the packaging substrate, which are there and cause AC effects, like losses, reflections, crosstalks, the simultaneous switching noise, all sorts of things which can affect the opening of your eye diagram if it's a communications between, say, high-speed memory and processor that you have in your 3D solution. So you've got to be able to account for these factors. You've got to be able to extract these features. You've got to be able to push these back into the simulation. Cadence SOC design enablement, I'm particularly calling out our automotive story because, um, well, we're talking about an automotive application. The Cadence has a very long history in analog custom design and also our digital tools, we blend them together. We've been working with the top 10 automotive semis for well over a decade, actually closer to two, 
We have most of the top 25 as our customer base. We work very closely with these providers, these customers, to build the best industry solution there is out there, and we continue to do so, to build a mixed signal solution for our automotive customer base and our wider customer base. To that, we've added additional features like high reliability for the high temperature, high voltage environment that you find within automotive. Uh, we've added high current capabilities for the kind of um, <coughs> power transistor, power MOS kind of applications that automotive demands. Uh, we have our Virtuoso Advanced Node, where below uh, 20 nanometers, you're dealing with a whole bunch of additional concerns new lithography, new design rules, new interconnect layers, new uh, transistor types such as FinFET, very, very high variation. Quite different design disciplines required to design below 20 nanometers. This has been hugely successful. We're so, quite surprised, actually, the, the difficulties that you have in these uh, advanced nodes. We have over 100 customers working on production uh, chips today with that. And then finally, uh, we worry about uh, very high yield uh, for Six Sigma manufacturing needs and ISO 26262 style tracing. Now, if we look at the MEMS, we work uh, with uh, Coventa, is our partner company there. And you need a very strong coupling between your uh, MEMS device, whether it's an accelerometer, a gyroscope, an energy harvester, or in this case, a LiDAR scanning mirror. Um, and you need to couple the analog and the MEMS device very, very tightly to get the performance. <coughs> in the case of uh, an accelerometer, you're trying to stop the thing self-destructing half of the time. But um, you need a very, very tight grip on that mirror to be able to get those 50,000 data points a second that you need. And so we co-simulate with the multi-physics models that Coventa provide for any um, MEMS device that you may be designing. Uh, with the controlling analog, typically a sigma delta circuit. And then finally, we come on to the photonics. Um, again, we've been working with partners, uh, Lumerical and Phoenix Software, both who've been mentioned here this morning already. Um, let me say that uh, we find that the photonics uh, are in the same position that RF was 15 to 20 years ago, and analog was 30 years ago. And uh, we are seeking to move the industry for photonic design forward. Um, we've been very successful in using the Cadence Virtuoso Custom IC backbone to enable people to do design of custom IC, standard cells, memory, analog, um, RF, mixed signal. This, this has revolutionized the way that these classes of design are done and we're seeking to reuse that knowledge within the photonics community. So we have our Virtuoso tools, which we show in red. Uh, we'll see them in a minute or two. All based around a PDK we heard from Global earlier. PDKs which are coming from the foundries, blessed by the foundries, contain the compact uh, models, the simulation models necessary for simulation, and the parameterizable uh, physical uh, layout cells. So you can build up, you can utilize components that the foundry provides to you as standard and then you obviously want to add to that you want to add your own collection and class of <coughs> components you want simulation models for them you want physical models for them this is where Lumerical is providing a component design capability for creating tapers couplings waveguides uh, modulators and um, also the full system simulation optical simulator this is providing you uh, simulation of the efficiency, your input to output powers, uh, accounting for margin, uh, margin enabling you to overcome uh, variation. As you can imagine, considerable variation when you actually fabricate, say, a 5,000 micron long waveguide. You've got to be able to account for the impact that these variations will have. Um, Phoenix are providing the uh, physical design, uh, parameterized physical cells, uh, which are based on curvilinear geometries. <coughs> this was new for us in Cadence, having to work with curvilinear. We're very much Manhattan, but you know, we, we've taken the plunge. So if I, if I kind of boil that diagram down and make it a little simpler, um, this custom IC backbone that I'm referring to is pretty much a PDK, which you're going to add to, a golden hierarchy of schematics, driving simulation, driving layout. 
And this way you have coupled and linked logical and physical design. This enables you to move from flat design to reusable components that can be composed hierarchically and configured hierarchically. Uh, move from build it and see to an optimized performance and account for margin for variability. Use the same custom IC backbone as custom analog mixed signal and RF design. Use the same use models, GUIs, and design methodologies <coughs> that we've spent 30 years developing. And use a familiar virtuoso de design environment for all of our customers. Um, this is to enable much more productivity, uh, much greater efficiency, and uh, hopefully uh, bring the game on. Let's look at an example uh, with a quadrature uh, phase shift keying transmitter. So here we have our transmitter, here we have a receiver, we have an electronic driver driving the transmitter. In fact, we have multiple instances of that driver. We push down inside the driver. Here's the reusable cell for the driving electronics. We push down inside the transmitter. You can see that it's composed of a number of electroabsorption modulators created using the Lumerical and the Phoenix tool. And we're able to drive all of these in a simulation where we're driving in just a series of ones and zeros, and we drive that into the system, and, and we look at what happens. So we're driving in those ones and zeros, just a random bit sequence, and we're creating a set of differential driving signals, which we can see here. We're pushing that through the transmitter. Now the other side that we're seeing um, some good I and Q plots and some very nicely formed constellation diagram of the I's and Q's. This is the kind of quality of results, the, 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 the metric that we're looking for with this class of transmitter. But there are some system realities. Uh, <coughs> How do we actually construct this thing? We have an interposer, which is also an active pick. It's here where the waveguides are being placed. Um, on the left, we have our, our laser. Well, in fact, we've got three flip die bonded laser diodes butt coupled to the waveguide in the, uh, the pick uh, device. And on the far side, we've got our fiber connector. And then on the top, <coughs> we have our flip chip uh, SOC electronic design connected with copper, <coughs> copper pillars. Um, and uh, you can see in the gray, that's the substrate of the pick device. And then because it's a flip chip, that's the substrate of the, of the SMC. <coughs> now using some of our security technology, we can extract those copper pillars <coughs> and look at those physical effects. These copper pillars are, the electrical pads are <coughs> under the copper pillars that are driving uh, the electroabsorption module. So having got this additional physical information, we can create S-parameter files from this. We can feed those S-parameters back into our simulation. And what we see is that, in fact, it's the electronics which is failing us because the total peak-to-peak -peak distance has considerably shrunk. In, it depends on the, where the bit sequence is, you know, where we've got lots of ones. It eventually gets up to full peak-to-peak. -peak. Switching rapidly between ones and zeros, we've got... The problem is we've got a longer RC constant because of those copper pillars. A lot of additional capacitance that we hadn't really accounted for. There's also an inductive effect. Um, so net result is a very poor constellation diagram. If we look at the physical, this is our electroabsorption modulator. It's got parameters which enable us to change its orientation, to change the number of layers that we show, to change the length. We're able to instantiate that in a physical design. That's part of our transmitter. So we have schematic-driven layout, where we're creating the layout from the schematic we started with. We're using a parameterized uh, cell that we created within the virtuoso environment. So moving to the mainstream, we really do want to move electrophotonic design from lab experiment to an efficient, predictable, full-scale design methodology. PDKs we talked about, they're the about a building block basis. We want to do design capture where golden schematic drives the simulation and layout. Pre-layout simulation, focus on design function and performance. Schematic driven layout, implement what you simulated. Physical extraction, parameter back annotation, and post-layout simulation. We want to do hierarchical schematic composition and configuration with mixed abstraction levels. We want to do hierarchical layout composition and configuration. 
Uh, we want to do design centering and optimization. Design function and performance must be robust and across all of the manufacturing variants. And we want to use measurement-based simulation so that uh, many design iterations, we're not seeing unintended consequences. We basically support regression testing. System design, account for all parts of the system. So to um, go back, uh, we are trying to move to the mainstream, but the mainstream is constantly moving forward as well. This is technology we use in electronic design called uh, fluid guard rings, which we've repurposed for silicon uh, photonic waveguides. <coughs> And as a result of being able to interactively, interactively manipulate the waveguides, uh, we have um, efficiencies where we are introducing the right s pens the right width adjustments, and the right control corner types as you're interactively modifying your waveguides. So to go back to the system realities, uh, if we look through the stack up, again, this is our Sigrity technology. We've got the uh, TSV and the substrate. We've got the silicon uh, oxide outside in the pick, we've got the channel, we've got pick routing, and then we go on to the CMOS routing, the CMOS channel, the CMOS substrate because it was flip chipped, and we've picked in that stack up, um, basically these are the copper pillars. Um, if we now look using that extraction data at the thermal effects of those copper pillars, and that particular <coughs> layer in the stack up, we can see that there is heat from the electronic drivers, and that the position of um, the germanium silicon uh, electroabsorption modulators sit right between those drivers. And so the heat is very close to the modulators. This time the electronics is fine, no trouble. But we've got uh, a much weaker performance from our modulators than before, and we've therefore degraded the quality effectively of, of our uh, constellation diagram. Um, in general, the whole industry is moving to a more than more state of looking at how packaging technologies can enable multiple dyes, multiple process technologies, and multiple technologies like MEMS, uh, SOCs, <coughs> silicon photonics, and so forth. We're working right now on a new solution which is integrating all of our capabilities, Virtuoso, Allegro, and Sigrity technologies. This is going to benefit the electronics industry. We have many customers showing a lot of interest in this blending of technologies, and it will be applicable uh, to photonics as well. That's part of the benefit of getting on to the mainstream. Um, in general, cadence is a provider right across the board. We've talked about a lot of different design styles. We talk about our capabilities for systems, software and IP, SOC design, packaging design, PCB design. We have partners with many players right across the industry with a significant ecosystem. It's a great train to jump on board. And finally, uh, to summarize, uh, there are a lot of more than more uh, aspects driving us along. Electrophotonic systems are beginning to start to materialize, which are multidimensional. Uh, many new applications beginning to come through. Um, really, all of this is in search of a full-scale design methodology. So my argument is that electronic photonic des electrophotonic design is moving from build it and see. Uh, we have unique cadence design enablement. It's built on a custom IC backbone with full system design. And uh, I think that's everything. Thank you very much. Thanks, Neil. A couple of questions for Ian? Uh, I'm going to go here first. Yeah. Um, in the example that you gave, I mean, that's an extremely difficult question to answer. I mean, the, the, the other part of that question is, is uh, what's the success rate of first silicon? Oh. Well, un unless you're going to account for these additional second or what appear to be second order effects and turn out to be first order effects, you've just wasted an entire cycle. I mean, the whole point of electronic design automation is to enable you to do all the what if experimentation up front, all of the optimization up front, all of the first and second order effects up front. You, the idea of going to silicon and saying, oh, it doesn't work. I mean, it just seems so outdated. And you're not going to 
Well, uh, what I'm saying is it can be very high. And the, the driver for a lot of this is our existing electronics customers who are taking a keen interest in the opportunity to also take on photonic design. They're the ones who are demanding of us that we provide them a photonic design environment, which is the one they're familiar with, with the standard use models, the standard GUIs and methodologies that we've spent 30 years working with them on. So they're the people who are driving this, not us. Uh, and it's their belief that it's going to enable them to get to better first-time silicon systems. <coughs> Thank you. My boy. Yeah, so the question is basically about what the co-simulation involves. I will be frank that today it is a serial electronic followed by photonic simulation. The example I showed you right up at the front of the electro-photonic PLL, which has more of an integrated loop feedback loop, needs you to actually run the two simulators, the optical and electrical, on a common time step. And that is a more complicated solution, but it's one that we're in the middle of investigating. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes,